as the right candidate to be elected. Today our guest speaker is Professor Shannon Gadarian, who will delve into what the professor has labeled anxious politics. This morning we learned about political sanity, political anxiety, engagement in politics that are promising and damaging for our democracy, and how substantive policy areas such as public health, immigration, terrorism, and climate change tangent into politics. Our speaker today is the co-winner of the 2016 Robert E. Lane Award for the best book in political psychology. <laughs> the Manly's Inform Series is, the, is most pleased and proud to have and introduce Syracuse University's Maxwell School of Citizenship, Professor Shannon Gary. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for having me. Monday morning, we're going to talk about anxiety and politics. <laughs> okay, so um, thank you for having me and for inviting me to talk about this work. Um, so this is, can you hear me? Is this better? Yes. Okay. Um, we're going to be talking um, about my book that um, co-authored with Bethany Albertson of the University of Texas came out last fall. Um, so we've been thinking, Bethany and I have been thinking about the role of anxiety in politics for many years now. It just so happens that our book came out at a relatively, a relatively good time um, in terms of the political cycle because as I've been joking, Donald Trump is the marketing plan for my book. And so you may have noticed in the media, in political campaigns, in the ways in which people talk about politics, it is often that they talk about what makes them fearful about either immigration or climate change or terrorism. There are many things in society, um, in our political landscape that can make you feel emotion. And our book is exploring what are the consequences when people feel fearful about politics? Particularly, what kind of information do they seek from the news? Who do they trust? And what kind of policies do they want to protect them? Okay. So whether it's from news media telling you that there are things that you should be worried about, like melting ice caps or terrorists trying to kill you, or it's political candidates who are also reminding you of things that might kill you. This is my, one of my favorite ads of all time, the quintessential fear ad, LBJ's 1964 Daisy Girl ad, which the tagline of which is, we, mu we must live together or we must die, which is a very <laughs> subtle kind of fear <laughs> message for people. Okay, or sometimes it's fake newscasters like Stephen Colbert when he was on the Colbert Show telling us we have the march to keep fear alive. Okay, so the question is, what is the effects of this kind of these kinds of fear messages? And again, a variety of attitudes and behaviors of people in the American public. Okay, so just to so just kind of ground us in what we're talking about in this book, we're talking about anxiety. Okay, we can call this fear, but anxiety is an unpleasant and aversive state that involves warning signals of danger. And for any of you who have experienced anxiety, it's not a particularly pleasant emotion. And our argument in this book is that because it is unpleasant, it signals you that there is a threat in the environment. Sometimes those threats come from physical things that might do you physical harm. Sometimes the threats are about um, your place in society. And because those threats are, make you feel uncertain, people want to deal with this anxiety in a variety of ways to cope with that. They want to feel better, they want to feel protected. Okay, And the ways in which we deal with that anxiety lead to um, both what we might think good things for democracy, that is, it leads people to be more um, trusting of people, of experts. That's one of our findings in our book, is that when people are anxious, they tend to turn to those people who have expertise in the policy area that is making them feel uncertain. And it is also the case that anxiety makes you seek out more information. But anxiety also has a variety of uh, effects on democracy that may 
uh, weaken democracy as well. It makes people more likely to want to take a, away rights from others in order to make themselves feel safe and secure. And it may also lead you to seek out information that only um, reintroduces anxieties in your life. Actually, seeking information in the news um, might actually just reinforce your anxiety, might not make you feel better. Okay? So, um, we have a variety of views in both politics and in political psychology about whether or not anxiety is actually good for democracy. Our book takes the perspective that anxiety and emotion more generally can't possibly be all bad for democracy or political life because it is so part of the ways in which we experience the world. And nothing that is so pervasive can possibly be all bad. But there are ways that, again, anxiety might enhance our democracy, but it may also undercut democracy as well. Okay, so in the book, we look at three outcomes, that is, how people who are anxious seek information in the news, who they trust in times of crisis, and what kind of attitudes people want, again, what kind of policies they want to make them feel better. In the book, we look at four, anxiety over four policy areas, but I'm happy to talk about anxiety in other policy areas. We look at immigration, anxiety over immigration, public health, terrorism, and climate change. Okay, I'm not gonna have a chance to go through all of them today, but I'm happy to talk about the dynamics, why we chose those, um, and how we think anxiety in other policy areas might play out. Okay, so part of the reason we pick those four areas is that we think they um, are in two, essentially two different camps, okay? We have some kinds of threats in um, political life that we might call unframed threats. That is, these are threats that are, have widely agreed upon causes of harm, that may include imminent bodily harm or death. You don't need anyone to explain to you why a hurricane or a, a disease outbreak or even right after a terrorist attack that these are things that you should be afraid of. You don't need political elites to explain that to you. right? So these are some of the threats that we look at in our book. As opposed to there are other threats in political life that we call frame threats. These are the causes of harm are debated. They're not necessarily physical harms. They're often about one's place in society or changing dynamics in society and or where the harms can be delayed. And these are areas where there's contestation between the parties and between elites about what causes the harm and what the solutions are. One of the useful things about having public health in our book is there are in most public health outbreaks or in natural disasters, there are a set of best practices that elite, that um, experts say you should go to to try and solve those harms, right? So what happens when you're anxious about a natural disaster like a hurricane? Well, NOAA and the National Weather Service are gonna tell you you should evacuate. That is the best practice in a natural disaster. That is not the case in all policy areas. What is, if you are anxious about immigration, what is the policy that is the best practice? Well, we don't have one because not everyone agrees that immigration itself is a threat or about the policies that we can have that will make us feel better and make us secure. So that's why in the book, most of our area policy areas fall into this latter category of frame threats. That is, there is, again, political contestation both um, about what makes, should make you feel anxious and what the solutions are over it. So I'm going to just talk to you about some of the findings. Again, I'm happy to talk about any ones that I didn't talk about or think about how this plays into this election cycle. So what we do in the election, um, so what we do in the book is we actually rely on a number of experiments where we make people anxious about a, per, a variety of policy issues, and then we measure their reactions afterwards. And I may look like a nice person, but I spent a lot of the last seven years figuring out how to make people fearful about politics. <laughs> and as it turns out, it's actually not that hard. Okay, so, and, and the candidates for president and your can, our local candidates for, for Congress, they know how to do this. The people who work for them know how to do this. Okay, so 
For one example I'll give you is in our study of information seeking, we were really interested in our expectation is when people are anxious from the literature and from our own theory, um, what we think happens is when people are anxious, they want to feel better, they want to feel protected, and so they're going to seek information that they believe will be helpful for them to make them feel less anxious. But if any of you have ever tried to Google a, um, or go on WebMD to look up the symptom of a, a headache, you, or you may have looked up that you have a headache and you then go on Google or WebMD and convince yourself you have a brain tumor, you know what happens that when people are anxious, actually in fact what they do is they seek information, but they pay most attention to that which is threatening. And why do they do that? Because threatening information is actually more useful to you because what we are, um, what we are designed to do as humans is to avoid harm. And so one of the ways you can avoid harm is to know what is the most dangerous, threatening thing that is out there so that you can avoid it. But this leads to a very interesting dynamic when you are in a political world, okay, where whether or not immigration is threatening is not the same thing as whether or not, again, a natural disaster or a brain tumor is going to harm you. And so what we find is in our experiment, we ask people randomly, we randomly assign people in this experiment. This was a nationally representative sample. People took this experiment online. They were assigned to either write in our control condition about what, made, what they thought about when they thought about immigration or what made them worry when they thought about immigration. The nice thing about this is they typed it out. We know what, the, um, what it is that makes people anxious. And then we let them go and read a number of news stories that we had found in the broader news. So that were, there were six choices. Um, four of them were about immigration, two of them were not. And of the immigration stories, two of them were threatening stories and two of them were non-threatening. So in the threatening stories, it was things like immigrants are taking jobs or they are a security threat. And in the non-threatening stories, it was things like immigrants make our our country stronger, or my, my family is full of immigrants, okay? So in this experiment, again, we randomly assign people to either tell us what makes them worried, or to write what they think of when they think about immigration. And through the exercise of writing out what made um, them worried about immigration, people actually report feeling more anxious about immigration just by going through that exercise, okay? so. So these are the kinds of headlines that people in our, our experiment had. These are things like my, um, people said things like, in the control condition, my parents were immigrants from Ireland or Ellis Island, illegal immigration, New World fences. These are things that people thought of. Or they said things that made them anxious, the strain on taxpayers in terms of welfare programs, English not being a common language. These are things that made people worried, okay? So again, these are the stories that they, Okay. that they could choose from. And we looked for, um, again, our expectation was once people, that people would seek out more information about immigration who are anxious, but they would be attracted to um, stories that were more threatening. And that's what we find. And we look for, um, we could look for this kind of um, bias in information seeking in a variety of ways. We ask people, we, we actually see which of the, the news stories they choose we ask them what they remember of what they chose. So lots of you might read stories that you don't necessarily agree with, right? But you're getting informed. So we were also asking of the things that you read, what did you remember? And then um, in an open-ended way, we asked people what they agreed with of what they read, okay? And we find that there is actually bias in all, bias not meaning anything wrong, right? But it was that, among our respondents who are worried about immigration and the control in the condition where we made them anxious about immigration, they were more likely to seek out immigration stories. So this is um, what is the proportion of the stories that our people read that were about immigration? So you can see the control condition, about 65% of the stories overall that people read were about immigration as opposed to 72% of the stories in the treatment condition. Again, everyone thought about immigration and only these people worried about it. So it led people to seek out more information about immigration. And then it also read, led them, so that's this same set of bars right here. And if we look at which are the threatening stories 
right here, versus non-threatening stories. Here's where I want you to pay attention, the difference between these bars. So this red bar here is people who were worried about immigration, and we had made them worried. Okay, and here are people who are in the control condition. So far more people who were worried about immigration sought out these negative threatening stories about immigration than the positive stories and compared to people in the control condition are people who are worried about immigration are paying attention to and reading more threatening information about immigration. So again, what we think people are doing is they are actually trying to become informed, they are trying to feel better. But what they actually do when they seek out information is they pay attention to that which is most threatening, which only reinforces your anxieties. In our experiment, we gave an equal number of stories that were threatening about immigration and non-threatening. If you look in actual news stories, it's actually very hard to find positive stories about immigration. So the real um, information environment is actually already quite biased towards threatening stories about immigration. And so we would think that in the real world, this would be even more heightened. Okay, we gave our positive stories an equal chance of being chosen, but that's not, but this bias, again, this bias or threatening information might be evolutionarily helpful if what you're looking for are threats in the environment that might kill you. In, immig in immigration or other policy areas where there's contestation, it's not clear that only seeking out um, information that's threatening is actually better for democracy, okay? So if you also look at, and again, you don't need to worry about these particular numbers, but if you look at, this is just information seeking, we also ask people whether they agreed with the stories. So here's this bar here, I'm gonna just draw your attention to here. Again, the control condition's in blue, the treatment condition is in red. So we ask people, do you agree with these stories? Well, we ask people in an open-ended way, what did you think of the stories, okay? And the, the major difference that we find is that people who are in the treatment condition, who we've made anxious about immigration, 48% of them agree with the threatening stories that they read, as opposed to in the control condition, about 33%. So again, we're driving, in this experiment, we're driving people towards threatening information about immigration, and then they, they tend to agree with that information more than the people who are not made anxious about immigration. And we think this is, we use immigration as our policy area, we think this dynamic plays out in many policy areas. Okay. So again, our anxious subjects were more likely to read threatening information regardless of partisanship. We also, so we have people of various partisanships in the study. We do find that Republicans in our study were more likely to remember the threatening information and were more likely to agree with that threatening information. But again, this is a particular policy area where anxiety about immigration is more likely to occur on the right because of the way elites talk about immigration, which is, tends to be more of an issue that the Republican Party has talked about in the last four years. If, this, we, if we were doing this on climate change, we would expect essentially the reverse. That is, Democrats would be more likely to seek out threatening information about climate change. They would be more likely to agree with it and remember it, okay? Because partially what people are doing are trying to figure out the information that will help them feel better, but also try and figure out information for people who are particularly motivated that might already, that might um, be consistent with what they believe already, okay? So I'm just gonna talk about one more of the studies. Um, so we think that one of the things anxiety might do is lead you toward information that is useful to you, that might help you avoid harm, but it, we also think in, in many policy areas, individual behavior is not going to be enough to actually protect you, again, you can, um, to stave off climate change, you could buy a Prius, but without major government action, that's actually not going to do very much in the grand scheme of things. So a lot of what we need to do in politics is actually put our trust in actors who can help make collective action that will avoid harm, okay? One of the ways that people do that is to put your trust in expert actors who you believe can actually do what they say to try and protect you, okay? 
So what we expect in our study is that anxiety increases trust in experts who can protect you and provide information for individuals to, pro to protect them from harm. Now, we believe that means that in many policy areas, you're going to choose to put your trust in experts. And in some areas, that's actually pretty easy to figure out who an expert is. Again, natural disasters are a useful um, area. Public health is another area. So if you're going to be anxious about Zika or Ebola or any kind of disease outbreak, your best bet is to find an expert who has a medical degree, who works for a health agency, who is a state actor who can help with some sort of um, public health um, outbreak. Okay. However, in some policy areas, it's not entirely clear who the experts are. Okay. So who, who is better? Who is the expert, again, on immigration policy? Well, we argue that in, we find in the book is that in these contested areas, in these frame threats, it's generally the party who owns the relevant issue. Okay? This issue ownership is kind of a concept that I think intuitively people understand even though if they don't use these terms. Okay? So when I tell you that if you look at the polling on different policy areas and you ask people which party do you think is better at handling um, say crime policy, which, po which party do you think people would say, regardless of your own partisanship, okay, if you would, would see, what, was your expect what would your expectation be about, if I say that there is one party that owns the issue of say crime and national security, which party would that be? Yeah, the Republican Party. Again, regardless of your own partisanship, okay, and you can see this, it's about who is in the coalition of these parties and the kind, the ways in which politicians talk about, right? You often see, you will see the CACO deacon race. CACO is going to run um, ads on security issues. He's going to run ads on, um, on criminal justice issues. These are ones where the Republican Party is seen as better, and he himself is seen as better. And that each party has a set of issues that they own. For the Democrats, it's climate change, it is education, and it's other um, kind of social issues. So when we see people being anxious over issues that are, again, more contested, what we expect is that people want to trust experts, and how do they figure out who those experts are? Well, it tends to be the party that owns the issue. Okay. So how do we um, how do we test this? Well, we have a set of experiments on um, both our unframed and our framed issues. Well, we had um, one experiment in 2011 where we randomly assigned people, again, this is a representative sample, um, we randomly assigned people to read two, well, it's really three, but I'll talk about two, two stories about a smallpox outbreak. So we were trying to make people anxious about a public health issue, um, and smallpox is actually eradicated, but many people don't know that. Um, so we made people anxious about it. Okay, so <laughs> we randomly assigned people to read one of two stories about smallpox. One that talked about an out a past outbreak, an outbreak that had happened in Cleveland, Ohio 25 years ago. Okay, and then the only difference between that and the other story is that we told people that there was a current smallpox outbreak, small one, in Cleveland, Ohio. And at the end we told them this wasn't real. Okay. Um, in case you're concerned about the, ethical, the ethics of this experiment. Um, but just this difference, just telling people that there was a current outbreak of smallpox was enough to make them anxious about, um, about these issues. Okay. Then we, and so this is, this is essentially what the story looked like. We randomly assigned people to read a story from the New York Times. It had this guy in a kind of full um, suit. And then we told them, again, either it was a current outbreak or a past outbreak, okay? So it, this is just um, how anxious were you, how, how strongly do you feel anxious and fearful um, based on reading this story, and we had a control condition as well. Um, and then you can just see people, higher values mean more anxious, so we were pretty successful in making people anxious about smallpox. Um, and I'll, I can, in Q&A, talk to you how we pick smallpox. Um, but here, what I want you to pay attention to is after we made people anxious, it wasn't just for fun, we wanted to see um, who they trusted to 
provide them information um, uh, to handle smallpox, okay? And here we're just showing you what's the percentage of people who say, and they said, I don't trust at all to I, I trust a great deal, okay? This is a four-point scale. So here we're looking at what's the percentage of people, and we asked about a variety of actors, both who were relevant, had relevant information and irrelevant. So we asked about things like the IRS and the Federal Reserve and Oprah. These are not people that we would expect to have helpful information about smallpox, okay? Although Oprah does pretend to be a doctor every now and again, okay? The Department of Homeland Security, um, the Pre President Obama, um, Health and Human Services, the American Medical Association, the um, Centers for Disease Control, and your own doctor. Okay, so we have a variety of people we asked about. The Surgeon General is on here as well. So the ones that are circled are the ones where we made people in our smallpox present condition more trusting than people who read about a past smallpox outbreak. Okay. So here, we made people in this anxiety-producing condition more trusting of the CDC, of Health and Human Services, of the Food and Drug Administration, and here, the Department of Homeland Security, okay? Now, Department of Homeland Security is not an, is not an agency that's actually expert on health issues, but in our study, we actually had a little bit about how smallpox could be a bioweapon, and so I think that's what's explaining this finding. But overall, the finding is that we made people more anxious about a public health issue, and they were therefore more trusting of agencies that have expertise in health issues. Okay, so good. We think that's useful, right? You're anxious, you turn to people who have expertise. But what if the issue, again, is more contested? So here we have a, a set of experiments where we make people more anxious about immigration using a campaign ad. And if we have time, I'll see if I could bring up the campaign ad. It, the only thing that's, so it's kind of an anti-immigration ad, an anti-illegal immigration ad particularly. Um, if any of you are, lived in California in the 1990s, um, the, it was very similar to Pete Wilson's anti-immigration ads when he was running for governor. Okay, so it was things like illegal immigrants take welfare, health care, and education dollars that go to hardworking Americans. We randomly assigned people to watch a, two versions of this same campaign ad, one of which had scary music and one of which isn't. Didn't. That's it. That's the only difference. Okay? The music itself was enough to make people feel more anxious. So what happens when you see, these are both anti-illegal anti immigration ads. Okay, what happens when people become more anxious after watching that? Okay, oh, so, see, I don't know if the music is, is there. I don't think we'll be able to hear it. Okay, that's okay. Okay, so I'll just play them side by side. You, so you can see, some of the imagery is actually very similar and some of it is different. Here's the, so you can see, these are, this is like the anti-illegal immigration. It's got this scary music, but it also has these images of people breaking the law and being arrested, so you just can see, okay? All right, after that we asked people to rate their trust in six randomly ordered political figures who could handle immigration. Again, if our, our expectations are that anxiety makes people more trusting of people they think of as expert, and in these framed areas we think that's the party that owns the issue, which in the, is, the area of immigration is the Republican Party, okay? So our expectation is we make people anxious about immigration, we should increase trust in the Republican Party, and that's essentially what we find, okay? Um, I'm gonna just point you out a couple of things, okay? First, we asked about six different figures after the people saw these, one of two versions of these ads, President Barack Obama, the Democratic Party, the Republican Party, citizen groups like the Minutemen, um, Arizona Jan, Gu uh, Jan Brewer, um, who was in the news at this point for having signed in um, some legislation that made it, because um, more restrictions on immigrants who are here illegally, um, and U.S. Customs and Border Control. And we, again, the scale was, I do not trust them at all, so I trust them a great deal. What we're really interested in is the differences, and you don't need to worry about um, reading the scale here, but the, the big difference is, um, we look separately at Republicans and Democrats, and what we find is among 
both Democrats, I'm just going to draw your eyes to this line, okay? So this is both Republicans up here and Democrats down here. And if they're to the right of the line, that means that the, Im um, the immigration ad that had the music made them more trusting of that actor. So this is both Democrats and Republicans in our study become more <laughs> trusting of the Republican Party after watching this single ad with the scary music. Okay? So if you wonder why candidates run all these ads that you might find annoying, it's for this reason right here. Because they want you to think about issues, and if you're going to be scared about issues, they want you to be scared about their issues, that they are best, at. they think of themselves as best at, okay? So again, what we find is that anxiety boosts trust in experts, people who we believe can handle the threat, but partisanship can shape who those experts are. And particularly with frame threats, that might mean that you put trust in a party that has an incentive to make you anxious about that issue. Okay, so um, the real question is when you see candidates in this election cycle, okay, who are going to run ads or they're going to make speeches and they're going to tell you about things that should make you anxious, who does that benefit? And if you, if you take nothing away from the talk, you should take away that Politicians have incentives to make you anxious about the issues where they see their party as better or they themselves are better. So the consistent question that I get from reporters or in this election cycle is, does that mean that terrorist attacks should help Donald Trump? Right? This is a kind of consistent question that I get because, again, the Republican Party is the party that has for many years been seen as the party of national security and better on issues of terrorism. So my answer to that is actually no. And here's why. Generally what people do when they use issue ownership, they use party as a proxy for expertise. Um, generally with almost any other Republican, I would say yes. That a terror, an exogenous terrorist attack that makes people anxious should benefit the Republican president. I worked to show this in 2004 and with George W. Bush and push people toward attitudes that line up the, with the Republican Party. This cycle is unique, unique in a variety of ways, but one of which is that the candidate who has expertise in national security is actually Hillary Clinton. And whether or not you like her or not, or like her policy, she actually has the advantage on expertise in national security. And so when you see the arguments being made about um, terrorism and terrorist attacks should benefit Donald Trump, our work is not consistent with that. Our work would suggest that what happens when people are anxious is that they want to turn toward the politician and the party that they believe can protect them. And given that um, Clinton was on the Senate Armed Service Co Committee and was a former Secretary of State, that mm -hmm. expertise advantage actually goes to Clinton this time. <coughs> and so it may be a wash that the Republican advantage that um, generally a, a kind of more mainstream Republican would get um, would benefit um, would benefits Trump a bit, but that Clinton is certainly not disadvantaged and actually I think gets the advantage on issues of foreign policy. And so this is just a question about who do you handle to, um, who do you trust to handle terrorism? Um, and this is just from uh, both, this is data from June, um, this one is September. About 50% of people say that they, in these polls, say that they trust Clinton to handle terrorism. Um, and Trump, anywhere between 39 and 43%. So again, even the polling bears out that Clinton gets this kind of benefit on expertise. Now again, this would, I don't think this would be the case um, among, if, among most candidates, if it were Jeb Bush or if it were even John Kasich, who was you know, a governor, or Rubio, I don't think this, you would see this dynamic. It's because particularly Clinton herself has expertise and um, has the backing of many Republican foreign policy experts. Okay, so again, the, some of the takeaways for today is that anxiety is consequential for contemporary politics and it should increase support for actors and policies that the public perceives will protect them. But protection is determined by the political context, okay? And while our work can give you a sense of what to expect in 
um, in many policy areas, um, we have to be very sensitive to the political context that we're working in. Okay? So that's what I have, and I'm happy to take questions. Okay. How do you get a control group that you can trust in it? So how do we get a control group that we can trust in an experiment? So that's a great question. So many of the policy areas that we're working with, there is a kind of baseline level of anxiety that people have about it, right? And so we're working, what we're actually doing is that we are getting people to either think about an issue or we're, get, we're just comparing levels of anxiety which Sometimes they're not zero, right? In our control condition, people are anxious about immigration, even if we don't tell them to be. But what we're really doing is comparing the levels of immigration. We're never going to get anxiety about many issues to be zero, in, even in a control condition. It depends on the experiment. We have seven different experiments. Some of them we ask people to, think, to read about a separate issue that isn't about the policy area itself. Um, but really, we're doing a comparison about people who are more versus less anxious in some policy areas. But honestly, in some issues, um, like in smallpox, unless you introduce smallpox to people, they're not worried about it. Okay, so there are there are differences in some of these areas where the the baseline level is very low, and in some areas, the baseline level of anxiety is quite high. But the, the more major point is that we're really looking at differences across the, the comparison conditions. Does that answer the question? Yeah, but the control groups are tough. I mean, you're using a control group of 50 people, 100 people, a million people? Oh, great question. So it depends on the size of the experiment that we have. So our largest experiment has 1,200 people, so we're comparing 300 people, to, or depends on how many groups we have. Mostly we're comparing groups of hundreds of people to each other, okay, um, and they're nationally representative samples. And some of our samples are smaller and we have, but the important thing in an experiment is that the control condition is randomly assigned. So there's nothing about people's own demographics that should necessarily drive them toward these, these findings that we have because the assignment to treatment is random. It is not determined by, um, by whether or not they're a Republican or a Democrat or a man or a woman. So we should have equal numbers, and we do have equal numbers of partisans and, um, and men and women in each group. So they look identical in demographics, except that we've made some of them anxious and not. Okay. Yeah. Okay. God forbid that we should have another major terrorist attack, mm -hmm. but uh, anything is possible. Sure. Uh, given that, um, and there's probably not many things that raise people's anxiety more than a major terrorist sure. attack. Sure. Um, what do you think that would benefit? A major terrorist attack? I still think that benefits Hillary Clinton. So again, so I have other work um, about what happens at what happened after 9/11 in terms of people's anxiety levels and the consequences for their foreign policy attitudes. Okay, and so you can look at the data from 2002, 2004, up to 2008, and what happens is people um, made more concerned about terrorism are more likely to support a variety of foreign policies that I call more hawkish. These are things like they're more willing to support um, military use abroad, they want higher defense spending. Um, these are, again, very consistent with the policies of Hillary Clinton herself. She's actually pretty hawkish on foreign policy. And again, that expertise, I think, confers an advantage on her that it does not confer on Trump, even though his positions on foreign policy are fairly, um, it's unclear where they are, but to the extent that we know where they are, they tend to be fairly extreme, um, which, again, I think um, the the kinds of things that he said about um, torture, about of um, uh, terrorist suspects and, and bombing the families of terrorist suspects, those are outside even um, the mainstream of American politics. So I don't think that, that even anxious people are that extreme. I haven't seen any evidence in the data for that. Um, and so I do think, um, you know, right, God forbid, Right, that we have another major terrorist attack. But I don't think that that necessarily benefits Trump. It may be a wash. Uh, I, I do think the advantage goes to Clinton there. Thank you. Thank you. 
Yeah. Back to your, back to uh, Mark's uh, question about the control group versus sure. the treatment group. The control group then may have been people who've done a lot of reading about an issue, but you don't assign them something to read. Whereas your treatment group, you assign them things to read and then, and then poll them or No, them? it depends on the experiment. So that's a good question. So what do we do with the control condition? So the control condition depends on the experiment. So in the smallpox experiment, our control condition read a story that was not about smallpox. It was of the same length. We had pre-tested it to make sure it was as interesting as the other stories that we assigned. But they went through the same exercise of reading a story and then it just uh, and then we asked them the same questions about who they trusted. Um, in in the um, bottom, so in the, again, it depends on, we have many experiments. So in this experiment with the campaign ad, everybody watched a campaign ad. Um, and here it's not, there's no real true control condition. It's really just how, how frightening is the campaign ad. So either you watch a campaign ad that had kind of neutral imagery and no music, or you watch a campaign ad had that, that had scary music and scary imagery. Um, so everyone in the control condition does basically the same kind of thing that people in the treatment condition do, um, but they're just not as anxious. Yeah. Uh, regarding the word anxiety, mm -hmm. And isn't there a level of anxiety about each of the candidates? Sure. And that Trump is basically selling that anxiety. Sure. That's his motive, that's his messaging. Well, so is Clinton, right? I mean, this whole discussion about Trump being dangerous, right, is also a, a fear appeal, right? So, so is the question, what's the impact of Yes, but the, the question is that it is all about anxiety. The whole election from stem to stern, from June of last year to November 8th or 9th of this year, is about this anxiety mm -hmm. that we all fester in our personalities and character and worry about. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of people in this room that have certain feelings and judgments about each of the candidates. That might change the moment they get to the poll. Maybe not. But it's amazing how the factor of the mentality and the characteristic of anxiety plays into this whole thing. Well, you just made a pitch for buying my book. Um, <laughs> but, but so what I would say is, yes, I, I agree that um, anxiety is a big part of this campaign. But it is also the part of many campaigns. We started this book in 2007. This is not that we wrote this in the last year. Um, the, again, the classic fear ads, many of those are from the 1960s. Fear is not, anxiety is not a kind of, it, it is a normal part of politics. Now, whether we like it or not is a totally different thing. Whether we think that should be normally part of our politics is a question. But I will say that it is, um, it is a bigger part of Trump's campaign if you look at the rhetoric. I mean, the, it was a very interesting summer in comparing the RNC to the DNC this summer. And partially this is about the, str the strategy of being an out party, right? So if, you're a, if you are running to succeed a Democratic president, your best bet is not to say that the world is falling apart. Your best bet is to say, we have, yes, there are dangers in the world, but we have made a lot of progress and we should continue that progress. If you are an out party, you want to make the pitch that things are bad enough that we need to switch courses. And that's, now, Trump spent 45 minutes at the RNC making a very unique kind of pitch, which is that the world is dangerous and that the only way to avoid that danger is to elect him. That is, a, that is a different pitch than many candidates make, which is that um, the world is dangerous and we need policies and we need the party and we need all of us. What was unique about um, Trump's RNC speech accepting the nomination was that it was a kind of very apocalyptic vision of what the US is 
uh, where we are, where we're going, and that he is the only person that could protect us. Again, that is a different kind of vision than many candidates make, which is, and pay attention to the language, which I know you, you are, when you see the debates, Clinton was talking last night about, this is about us as the voters. Trump is not usually talking in those terms. Again, it's a different kind of strategy. But I would say that fear is not new, um, but it is being used in this kind of somewhat unique way in this cycle. Yeah. When you pick people to be in your, your groups, yeah. does their education level, their age, their whether they live in the center of this country, which is very different than the sure. east and west coast, do, what, do these things enter into it? So this is a good question about uh, research design. So do we have any demographics that moderate these effects as of what you're saying? Is there kind of any interactive effect between, are some people more affected by anxiety than others? So we haven't found, so one of the nice things about random assignment is that we should have equal numbers of people from different regions in each country. So it's not that their region or their age or their gender are driving these effects. What we're really finding is the effect of the treatment itself that is making people anxious. But what we do find is that, it that we, there are two major findings that we explore in the book, which are about partisanship and about ethnicity. So um, it is harder in some types of communications to make people anxious about issues. And because what they do is they put up kind of partisan blinders and they refuse to become anxious. When we do things like um, use a, a campaign ad, it is much harder about immigration, say. It is much harder to make Latinos anxious about illegal immigration in our studies than it is to make whites anxious, okay? It is also harder to move Democrats, even though we do in the study, about immigration when we are using campaign ads and when we use, say, a newspaper treatment or this bottom-up treatment where people create their own anxiety. And the argument that we make is that when people see persuasive kinds of communications that they know are intended to move their attitudes and they don't want to, they are motivated to stay consistent, they are less likely to accept the anxiety because they are feeling manipulated. Okay, um, and that's a, and we look at a variety of different kinds of experiments, um, and we do find that we can move Republicans and Democrats pretty equally on some kinds of with some kinds of communication, but with more clearly persuasive kinds of communication, we have smaller effects, and that's because again people put filters on the information that they'll accept because they don't want to feel manipulated. What about education level? We haven't found differences in education level. Have? Have not. Uh, I was going to ask a simple question like, are you an optimist? But that would be too simple. Um, that, that doesn't seem to be a simple question, but... <laughs> what, what I was going to say was that uh, uh, I wasn't that part of the greatest generation. I was born in 45. But, but most people look back upon World War II, regardless of the horror that, that occurred, and millions and millions of people that died, as the last time there was a general consensus in this country around uh, an, an anxiety, a threat, a, a threat that everyone recognized was, was uh, real, uh, especially after the attack of Pearl Harbor. And, uh, and, and, they, and they, they trusted, uh, the, uh, most people trusted the authorities, the president, generals, whomever, to uh, ad uh, address that threat. And then there was a broad general sacrifice uh, that cut across socioeconomic uh, classes, religious uh, 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 affiliations, ethnic groups, uh, all kinds of people flowed into the military coexisted during this enormous effort. Uh, and then when, they, when, when and, 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 and the war was won, uh, the, the people came back, and uh, at least uh, the, those that flowed into politics, uh, Republicans and Democrats, they, um, they had relationships, they had common experiences, they had ways to communicate with one another, an incentive to communicate with one another, even though uh, they disagreed. And, uh, but today, uh, given the problems that exist today, do you see any issue 
that is so uh, uh, critical uh, that, that there could be a similar consensus that would uh, bring people together uh, across the divide that exists. Uh, I mean, it's 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 just incredible. I mean, one could argue that uh, we're faced with this existential threat of climate change, but you know. Sure. There's I, division. Right. I mean, there's there are many differences between the time around World War II, and I would I would suggest that while there was an existential threat and it did bring many people together, there were many other things that got pushed off the agenda for many years because of that, right? And so this idea that we we all work together um, and and is true, and it, and we can think of that as a kind of highlight of civic engagement. Um, but and that trust in government was very high, but it was also a time where we decided we were also not dealing with with issues of race, and we were also not dealing with issues of gender, and those. So we can we can come together, but not everything gets solved at at that one time. So um, do I think that there is an existential threat that can bring people together? I hope not, right? I hope it's not of the same kind of enormity that is that was World War II. Um, I'm just trying to think about. The, I mean, there, the other thing that's very different now is, as you point out, is polarization between the parties and um, and trust in government. That these things are also the parties are quite far apart on many issues. <laughs> And there are um, the trust in government is quite low. So I'm teaching one of the reasons I'm going to have to run earlier than I would like to today is that I'm going to teach my public opinion class to graduate students at Maxwell. So today we're talking about um, the ways in which people get involved in politics. And we're going to read a piece by Suzanne Mettler, who if you haven't had into talk, you should. She's a Cornell professor but lives in Syracuse. What's her name? Suzanne Mettler. I'll, I'll check it out with you. Yeah, she's great. Um, and so we're going to read part of her work on the GI Bill. So her argument about the GI Bill is that it actually produces a great deal of civic engagement among people, particularly men who benefited from the GI Bill after they come back from World War II, because it is a broad-based program that gives people resources um, and that they can then be, become part of the polity. So my hope would be that we don't necessarily need an existential threat, but that we could have a policy program, maybe not of the kind of same size of the GI Bill, but that could actually provide um, resources to people and show that government does not always have to be evil. Sometimes it can provide goods for people and that could help increase trust in government because trust in government is, a, is an essential component to functioning governing, government. Um, so I hope we get to also solve issues like climate change, but that also requires that people, um, so one of my hopes about climate change is that there are nonpartisan actors that can tell people that climate change is a threat and that we need to, again, endow government, um, state government, national government to actually help solve this issue. And so I have actual hopes about things like the papal encyclical on the environment, that there are religious voices, there are nonpartisan voices that can get around partisan polarization on issues that are very important, like climate change. So that's kind of a long answer. I'm not sure it fully answers it, but I'm hopeful um, that there are, again, that people can get out of polarization on these big issues that we don't necessarily need, like a major terrorist attack to bring the country together. Do you have a question? I did. Um, so do you do any work on the de-escalation, like following election day when all of these anxieties have been heightened? Then what? Uh -huh. Great question. So I'm way better at making people anxious than making them feel better. <laughs> um, so, but here, the, that's a really good question. And I actually think we need to think about what happens when people um, need to start to work together. And I think that's the point at which um, we need to see democratic institutions functioning. We need to see um, a, a peaceful handoff of power, and we need to see um, that, that 
the Congress will be functioning, we need to see that um, all of these institutions that we rely on are going to function no matter who wins. This is why I was very, I'm very concerned when I hear candidates saying things like the, the election will be rigged, that you cannot trust government, that you are, um, that I'm going to jail my opponent if I win. This is, that kind of thing actually will only heighten anxiety. Um, and only through strong, small d democratic institutions and a, a peaceful handoff of power with no electoral violence, right? I actually have my own anxieties about this election. And one of them is that this, this language about the election being rigged is actually going to lead to real violence on election day. Um, and that that is going to delegitimize for many people um, the, the handoff of power. So, yeah. How much do you think Putin is really involved in the saying, or is this just a lot of hot air? Well, okay, so how, how much do I think Putin is involved in it? So that's outside my realm of, of expertise. Um, so people further up the security chain and who know many more things than I do think that, that Russia is involved in um, and is ha is involved in hacking um, with, and it's unclear what the intent of that is, but I imagine it's part of this delegitimization process of trying to make it seem that this election is not free and fair. Um, and again, this is a concern of mine that, um, that we are going to lead to kind of further distrust in government. Um, again, I think we should, we should hold um, government officials accountable when they do bad things. Absolutely. But I think that um, delegitimizing how our institutions work, and especially when that comes from a foreign actor, is, um, is very damaging. Yeah. So do we have any checks and balances to see, no matter who wins the election, that it, was, that it wasn't affected by him? Um, I mean, I mean we, we, we do a paper thing that sure. we put in a machine. Yeah. So that means now that maybe they're going to have to go back and count each and every one of these paper votes. Um, I don't. I mean, that seems unlikely to me. I mean, I, I'm not sure how how we could we could. I mean, there are absolutely checks and balances to to help count the ballots. Um, I'm not sure that that anyone is suggesting that Putin actually has people in the U.S. who are going to affect the ballot box, um, but there are but there are um, capabilities for checking the machines themselves to make sure that they are um, that they are actually counting the ballots correctly. Those are both smoke gun, really. Um, yes and no. Uh, <laughs> I mean, so do we think to to I haven't seen any reports that would suggest that the Russian hackers are able to affect the election machines themselves. That doesn't mean that these hackers who are, infl are kind of hacking emails that are on government servers or trying to embarrass different members of the Democratic Party or others are not trying to influence the election. They're just not like stuffing the ballot boxes physically. Yeah. If they did some uh, post-electoral electoral polls on people, would they do it on Congress dealing with if Trump got in, how would the Republicans who were against him, how would that react? And how would the people react who were so, because it's such an emotional election that there are going to be a lot of disgruntled people out there, both in Congress and the John Q. Republic. Sure. I mean, I mean, after every election, there are going to be people who are disgruntled. There, and so again, I think part of the way that we get, and people will be sad and they'll be angry and some people will be really enthusiastic. And I think come inauguration day, many of those feelings, again, if we have a, a, a peaceful transition of power, which I assume we will, that people will feel at least heard <laughs> and that they can um, have their voice counted and their vote counted even if they don't get what they want. Okay, this is why, again, my concern about the arguments about 
the process being unfair would lead to harder feelings that don't go away on Inauguration Day. When you think, even if you don't get what you want from government, we know that people are in a democracy will accept the outcome if they believe the process was fair. And from all measures, right, there are political scientists who spend a lot of time measuring the fairness of election, measuring how, um, how free countries are. The US ranks very highly on these measures. Um, so people don't have, shouldn't have real concerns about the legitimacy of the electoral process. And, and when elites try to make you feel that the process is unfair, they are, they're, that's dangerous for, right? The fact that in the first debate that um, the question had to be asked, would you accept the outcome of the election is a bad sign, <laughs> right? The answer to that question has to be yes, regardless of who you are, what party you, you support. The answer has to be yes, is I will accept the outcome of the election. Even if the outcome of the election is determined by the Supreme Court or if it is determined by Congress, the answer to that question, if you are a presidential candidate, has to be yes, because it is about the legitimacy of our democracy. The difference would be taking a poll a month or two after the person takes office and then a year later sure. and see how the people have changed positively or negatively. Sure, and that will absolutely will be done. So the American National Election Studies um, is a survey that is done every four years. Um, it is uh, funded by the National Science Foundation. It is has that kind of is the gold standard for surveys on voters. They are in the field right now, before the election. They're gonna be in the field after the election. They will follow up with people uh, in two years at least. Um, they may follow up with them earlier than that. So people, you know, there are survey researchers out there who will have that data. For any of the messaging over decades of American history, are there any tipping points where a candidate or a party pushed too hard on something to raise fear? Um, are there tipping points where candidates and parties have pushed too hard? Yes, um, I'm trying to think of, so it's not exactly that people, nece candidates necessarily push too hard in their political communication. It is that sometimes they're not seen as, ha as having some legitimacy over that issue. Um, so when you, so if you think back to 2008, and um, Hillary Clinton running against Barack Obama, and she's running on issues of security in 2008, and she's talking about, you know, will you be there at 3 a.m.? That was not an ad, you know, it was trying to make people feel f fearful about um, some foreign policy event, and, and Obama's inexperience. I think that kind of ad, it was inconsistent with what people believed about her at the time. It was also inconsistent with views on gender and toughness, and it didn't work quite as well um, back then. Um, so that's, there are, so the Daisy ad that I've been talking about for a long time, um, this is an ad that in 1964 ran only once, because it's, it shows, it, have you guys seen this ad? It shows a nuclear bomb exploding, <laughs> and LBJ's voice <laughs> talking about, Again, we must live together or we must die, right? That is seen as kind of over the top and it's very controversial. Um, those kinds of very extreme messages are often seen as um, too, too much. They overload people on fear. Um, but I do, think, I do think that people can overload the fear and what happens is that, that avoidance is also a coping mechanism. So people can, at some point, decide that they're just going to turn the TV off, um, and they're, or they're going to, or going to stay home, um, and that, and you want to, you want to avoid that point. Any one, more questions? One more question. Okay. Uh, the success of both Donald Trump and Bernie Sanders uh, in the support they got shows that there is great deal of dissatisfaction in the country about the role of government. Uh, after the election, whoever wins, they're going to have to address the fact that at least maybe half the country 
is not happy with the role of government. What's your take on that? So um, I would dispute that that um, that it's half the country who's dissatisfied with the role of government. So um, we we, we want to be clear that primary voters are not the same as general election voters, and that even though um, Trump ends up with the you know being the nominee and and Sanders does better than expected, we shouldn't think that party activists or people who are active in primary politics are the same as. The general election. So there is general dis there is a sense that government is not working for everyone, and I think that um, that is something that the whoever the next president is will have to deal with um, a sense from uh, the constituencies who think that the jobs aren't there for them, and if that's white men in their 60s who had manufacturing jobs that have left or it's young people who are coming out of college now who have a great deal of college debt. I think the next president will have to think about how to reach the dissatisfaction over those economic issues that people don't feel that they can be as successful as their parents were and their grandparents were. Um, I think though that's partially due to structural issues that, can, that presidents um, have not that much control over. Um, and things like manufacturing going overseas and uh, but there are things that the next president can do certainly to try and reach out on job retraining to think about making college more affordable um, there are ways in which i think presidents and with congress can try and make reach some of those people but i do again i don't want to hit this part point too hard but i do think a clear fair legitimate um transition of power from one president to another will at least start this process of telling the public that you may not be very happy now, but at least we're going to try again in January. Okay, We're going to start thinking about how to make health care more affordable to people. We're going to think about, um, again, making other processes more transparent. Um, and that, will, I think, you know, this election has been very long. <laughs> I think once it's over, people will start to become happier again. Um, but it's a, it's a good question. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.